Good morning and welcome to New Day Northwest. We start today with the issues, the problems that are roiling our community and are at the center of protests here in Seattle and around the country. The killing of George Floyd is reignited, calls for police reform and accountability. But what does that look like and how do we get there? I talked with Allison Holcomb from the ACLU of Washington about these very issues. You look back over the 50 years plus, it can be disheartening. Um, you know, the point uh, has been made that what we're seeing now is nothing new. Perhaps the fact that now we're seeing it um, and capturing it more and capturing the details so that it can't be explained away will actually force a different kind of conversation and a different kind of outcome. You know, the death of George Floyd was especially poignant. It's and not any more tragic than any of the other deaths resulting from unnecessary use of police violence than, that we've seen in recent years. But the fact that um, we had the added layer of his cries for help, I can't breathe, over sustained application of force over nine minutes, when six years ago we were hearing Eric Garner plea, I can't breathe, um, it's really, um, I think, touched a nerve that we're seeing expressed in here in Seattle and Minneapolis and all across the country, that communities are truly stunned and more outraged than ever before. They can't believe that it's still possible for, um, after watching Eric Garner, after watching um, Tamir Rice, um, for all of these incidents to be caught on cell phones, to be broadcast nationally, for there to be such public outcry about it, and for an officer still to be able to sit on a man's neck for nine minutes while other officers watched and prevented onlookers from intervening. Um, so it feels like we're truly having our crisis moment of policing and, and that it is substantively different than um, perhaps what we've seen in previous decades. I just want to tell people who are watching this, everybody appreciates good, effective policing. We depend on it and we applaud those, those officers. Nobody's in favor of ripping cities apart. This isn't about that. This conversation is about how the community and police officers work together. And I noticed today that there were um, scenes all over the country of police officers taking a knee with people, talking with people. I'm not saying this is the majority of what's going on. I'm just saying that there were many, many scenes of common ground being reached. And I'm wondering how we live in that space. How do we get there? It's, I'm so happy that you pointed that out because I think you put your finger on the key to what comes next, that communication directly between police and the communities that they police. Um, that was one of the most touching um, aspects of the ACLU's involvement with Initiative 940 in 2018. Um, that was the Washington State uh, ballot initiative, you'll recall, that was reforming um, the standard for holding police accountable for use of deadly force. But even more importantly, it was about also insisting that we have improved training around de-escalation of encounters and mental health training to help with that de-escalation. And the, the theme that the families and communities chose to um, place at the center of the campaign and to really shape all of the narrative of the campaign around was building bridges, building bridges of communication between officers and the communities that they work with, that they are committed to keeping safe. You're absolutely right. And that is the overwhelming truth for most of our um, people in uniform who are serving their communities. They're committed to the safety of, of their communities. But we can't ignore the generations of systemic violence that have been baked into our policing culture. And those are the tough questions that we have to grapple with. And we're not going to do it if we're standing across the room screaming at one another. We actually do have to sit down with one another and have those conversations to build those bridges of understanding and to dismantle um, the structures that were in place before that contribute to ongoing escalation of tensions.
What are the policies that we should be enacting? For example, should there, I mean, should anybody ever use a chokehold? Is there any reason to put your body weight on somebody's neck for nine minutes? Is there, uh, is there a responsibility to de-escalate? What, what do we need to do specifically so that there's some kind of uniformity of understanding that we're in this together? Focusing on more current professional, the best practices training around de-escalation is critical. And it really does start as far upstream as we've been talking about. How um, officers look, how they speak, how they encounter. Do they use a loud voice? Do they use a soft voice? Are they asking questions? Are they sharing information? Just like a, a good doctor who has excellent um, uh, patient communication skills is constantly talking to that patient calmly, reasonably, and sharing information about what that doctor is doing. Police officers should be doing that. By the time we get into the question of whether or not a chokehold is appropriate or not, we've already we're already in a situation that probably didn't need to arise in the first place. There probably were options. I'm not saying in all cases, but we certainly see more of a history of escalation of tensions than de-escalation. And we also, we also have to remember throughout all of this that the person that the police officer is encountering is going to have a different response based on, again, the histories of what they see on television, what they've heard from their family members, what their mothers taught them as children growing up. You know, we have a son, I've never had to have the conversation with my son that you have to watch out because at a certain point, police officers are going to be more likely to be violent towards you um, because of the color of your skin. And so we bring all of this as human beings into these situations and our escalation and de-escalation tactics have to be taught at the very beginning of every encounter that a police officer has with um, a member of the community. What's our next immediate step? If you could just wave your magic wand and tomorrow we would tackle this particular thing, what would it be? I think it would make, be making it easier for Seattle community members to engage in the conversation, making information um, more available as quickly as possible from the Seattle Police Department, from the mayor's office, from the city council, from the community police commission. And I would encourage um, viewers to go online and look at the Seattle Community Police Commission's website, sign up to get updates, follow them on Twitter and Facebook, and to do the same with other organizations that are leading in this space and are starting to create the conversations that need to be had. Black Lives Matter, Not This Time, Mothers for Police Accountability. These are organizations that have been in the work and doing the work, Seattle King County NAACP, um, they've been in the work and doing the work for decades, and they have the individuals with lived experience who need to inform the conversation about what does the new path forward look like. This was just a portion of my conversation with Allison. You can see the full interview right now on our website. 